My name is Margaret Busby. I should tell you a bit who I am. Uh, I was C.L.R. James's publisher in London in the 70s and 80s. How did I get to that situation? Well, my, my father was a, a long, lifelong friend of C.L.R.'s. He was at school with him in, at QRC, Queen's Royal College. And they kept in touch all their lives. And so when I became a publisher, when I started the publishing company at the end of the 60s, it's came to my attention. I mean, C.L.R. James was somebody I'd known because of that connection with my father, as well as my father's other friends, such as George Padmore and Leary Constantine, who I met as, as a child. But I realized that most of C.L.R. James's works were out of print, with the exception of Beyond a Boundary, which had been published in 1963. But at the end of the 60s, Black Jacobins was out of print in Britain, as was Marinus so I decided to try and reprint some of CLR's works uh, as well as uh, put together some selected writings. So I published three volumes of selected writings and reprinted, this, this is one of them, reprinted Black Jacket Bins, Notes on Dialectics, uh, Mariners, uh, published in Krumah and the Garden Revolution. So that's how come I, that was my connection with C.L.R. James. Now, we have a panel here of very distinguished people who each have connections with C.L.R. James in a different way. We've asked Mike Dibb to join the panel because at the end we, we hope there'll be time for questions and if there may be questions on the, the two films that Mike made. That, but we're going to start with Selwyn Kudger, who is Professor of Africana Studies at Wellesley College in Massachusetts, and he's written, he's a fellow Trinidadian like C.L.R. James, and he's written books on C.L.R. James, um, he co-edited C.L.R. James, his intellectual legacies, and he's the author of Beyond Boundaries, the Intellectual Tradition of Trinidad and Tobago in the 19th Century. Now, I think Selwyn's going to give us something of the historical perspective. Okay, thank you so much, Margaret. And it's so nice seeing Margaret after all of these years, I remember when she began to pine in work. Alison and Busby. That's right. Bringing all these books was still in styrofoam. I remember having to read them. Also want to thank Christian for inviting me. And also good to see Eric Hundley. I remember they had done Walter Rodney's uh, uh, work, uh, How You Open the Villa of Africa, a yellow cover. And that was the 1970s. Good to see him again. Also good to see uh, the people I've known. But most importantly, I'm glad that uh, Kudra came with me and Nathan came with me and Chris is here and all that kind of good stuff for some good backing up. Well, I thought I would do something a little different, and rather than you know go through a lot of things that have been said about James and it was done in the film and so on, one thing that struck me when I was looking at the uh, piece that you did on James, and you're speaking about Padmore, and you said that Padmore's name is, was uh, Padmore's father and James's father were friends, and that Padmore's name uh, was as far as Alfonso Nurse, and of course didn't know each other. Well, I'm from Tunapuna. And I went to the same school that, J that Padmore's father went to. It was a cocoa, it was called the Coco House. <laughs> it was built by slaves in 1837. And that's the school that, J that James uh, Padmore's father went to. And of course, Padmore and Tunapun was like two miles away. And what strikes me about all of these discussions is the fact that sometimes, and this is my friend Kajo's big beef, we present these guys as though they dropped out of no place. We will sometimes present James being this very unique character, which he is not. James was part of an intellectual formation that was taking place in the 19th century, which is what part of my concern is. In 1997, writing the New Left Review, I, began, I did a piece called C.L.R. James, and I think you again alluded to that in both of the films that he did. They didn't learn Shakespeare on their mango, on, on their mango tree. And I wrote a piece called C.L.R. James and the Trent Tobago Intellectual Tradition or Not Learning Shakespeare Under a Mango Tree. And I began it in this way because I think it was important to put James in a larger context and a larger tradition. I'm going to argue even James is aware of that tradition because when he writes in The Beacon in 1935 about uh, uh, M M Michel Maxwell Phillips, who had written the very first novel in Trinidad in 1854, James was aware of that tradition. He was also aware of, of other people who were writing. So I think it's important to do that. And I began my piece in uh, C.L.R. James, 1997, 
uh, not learning Shakespeare on the Mango Trent, James and Lewis of that. He's, I said, Trent Tobago has produced many outstanding scholars, particularly during the first half of the 20th century. Sylvester Williams, usually described as the father of Pan-Africanism, George Spadmer, author of Pan-Africanism or Communism, among other titles, and other prominent members of that family, even people like Eugene Chen, twice Minister on Foreign Affairs in the National Government of China under Sun Yat-sen, Eric Williams, Prime Minister of Trent Tobago, Oliver Cromwell Cox, author of Caste, Class, and Race, etc. Hooker, J.R. Hooker, an author of Henry Sylvester Williams, remarked that, quote unquote, Trinidad has produced a disproportionate number of unusual men. That's a truism. That so many of them have been forgotten is a scandal. Any small island capable of launching an Eric Williams, a C.L.R. James, a George Padmore, Vidya Naipaul, to mention a few whose reputations are secure, requires attention. So that James, in fact, comes out of a very, very important tradition. Also in this story, and James tells the same story in a way, one has the notion that in terms of the indigenous tradition or the indigenous intellectual tradition had none of James' formation. I think James, in a way, having to talk about his not having learned shapes in the mango tree and his, his acquaintance and awareness of the European tradition to some degree downplayed that Trinidad and Tobago intellectual history. But it's important to understand that history because James, as I say, is a product of that history. About six years after writing that piece, I wrote a piece called, a book called Beyond Boundaries, which I sought to document the intellectual tradition of Trent Tobago in the 19th century, a tradition out of which James came and certainly one which he was aware. In a way, it also sought to put a light to Naipaul's contention that when he delivered his Nobel Prize lecture, when he said, for example, that there were no local morals for him to follow. Naipaul argued that, quote, unlike the French child, Trent Tobago possessed no tradition of literature into which he could delve, no tradition of scholarship into which he could immerse himself. That was a lie then. It remains a lie today. And I hope to seek to explicate James as we try to locate him in a tradition that gave him life to the degree that made him who he was. As James himself said, and I quote, he says, the longer I live, the more I see that people are shaped to the degree that they do not yet understand by the social relations and family and other groups in which they belong. Karl Marx, a couple of, uh, of course, put, his, put the same idea in a different way when he said it's not consciousness that determines life, but life that determines consciousness. James was, in fact, a product of Trinidad society. One can argue that given the pressure of his time, James sought to underplay the importance of the African ideas and practices that determine his life. In another published piece called Tagarigwan, the Cradle of a Caribbean Intellectual Thought, I've argued for that important dimension of the African dimension and that tradition, which is said is, of course, downplayed. Also remember, James arrived here at the age of 32. At, 82, at 32, your ideas are formed. You may grow. And I'll bring a quote. I think Hoxbond spoke about that to some degree in terms of tradition. Now, first of all, we want to know that, of course, James came from that Tagarigua, Tunapuna, Aruka area, where, for example, the African tradition in Trinidad was the most profound at the time. In point of fact, that whole area from, say, Port of Spain right up to Arima was inundated with African practices, etc and people coming in. First, we note the tremendous influence of Africans in the Tagarigua, Tunapuna, Aruka areas during the 19th century. Most of our African population came to our shores between 1783 and 1833. Some from Africa, some from America, while others came from other West Indian islands. In 1851, the 1851 census <laughs> lists something about 6,000 native-born Africans, about 7% of the population, but by 1861, there were fewer than them. Among others, the linguists, of course, who, of course, James, I'll talk very briefly about it, J.J. Thomas, a linguist, theory of Creole grammar, notes about 16 different African ethnic groups at the time. The Yoruba and the Mandingos, he says, 
being uh, the most important. During the 19th century, many Africans came from Barbados. And of course, James Louis Fack, his, his grandfather on his father's side came from Antigua, but his grandfather uh, on his mother's side came from uh, Barbados. Now, Barbados is very important in the story. I've written another piece where, for example, they all came at the middle of this 19th century. You have the opener. Trinidad, of course, is one of what's called the new territories. Trinidad and Guyana are the new experimental territories, which, of course, the lands are fertile. Barbados and Jamaica are, of course, territories which have been exhausted. The sugar industries open up in Trinidad and Tobago, and of course, a lot of the new people who will do, and James spoke with his, his grandfather about that. He spoke about Josh, you remember, for example, in uh, Beyond the Boundary, that they are coming, of course, to bring with them skills. But the most important <laughs> skill was that of a pan boiler, of course, who in fact was concerned with making the sugar. But a lot of Bajans, if you want to call it that, came in Trinidad, and the importance of the Bajans was very important. They brought with them literacy. James would argue, of course, his parents were Anglicans. He always talked about Puritanism. But they were primary Anglicans. And I've done a long piece, which I shan't go into here now, in which, for example, the Anglicans had one thing the Catholics did not have. They brought the Book of Common Prayer. And as you know, in terms of the Book of Common Prayer, one can learn to, the Roman Catholics could not read the, could not read the Bible. The Anglicans, of course, could read, and a lot of our morning services, our Christians, came from that book from which, of course, literacy came. So in a way, in terms of James talking about Josh Green, his forefathers, and so on, he's concerned about the language. He makes a big thing which talking about language and the word. James is very much concerned about that. So first of all, the Bajans bring with them literacy, and James and Padmore and Sylvester Williams, Nurse, and others are very much influenced by that. Three influences then in terms and over and beyond that background in terms of the language background and the, the acquaintance with the ABCs, the acquaintance with language, and the important incidental thing last year was the 200th anniversary of the Common Book of Prayer. Now, if you're not an Anglican, you wouldn't understand that. But it's very important in terms of that's where you got everything from. Now, in terms of James' influence, and in terms of the influence also which it comes, there are just simply three or four names I'll just simply give you in terms of one, Jean Baptiste Philippe. Jean Baptiste Philippe is a whole movement of free people of color, but who call themselves people of African descent, who as early as 1841 are protesting about the fact that blacks are not being given any chance to be part of the social formation and the social structure. Later on, of course, but early on in Jean Baptiste Philippe wrote something called free mulattoes. And the free mulattoes are arguing against the question that they're unable, as colored people or people of African descent, to participate in governance. And what they do, I make a big case, I think, written both in my book, for the whole role of the enlightenment in terms of the whole role of reason that begins the function at that time. The second and most imp other important persons I said in terms of James's formation, I'm saying James was aware of the situation. He wrote about it, was a fellow called Michel Maxwell Philip. And Michel Maxwell Philip wrote a very important book called Emmanuel Apadaka. And of course, the importance of that, Emmanuel Apadaka, he goes back to the roads of the Egyptians and their formation in Trinidad and Tobago. And the next and more Im most important person would be someone called J.J. Thomas. And J.J. Thomas, Writes, of course, you know, fraudacity when fruit, fruit comes down there from London and does his thing, of course. And James, I think, in an issue in New Beacon, I think, in 1869, when they reproduced that place again, James is saying that we come from a literate culture where there was a lot of activity taking place, and so I came out of not, I came out of something. So James, I want to argue, was part of a larger formation. He was not. In, um, of course, now in terms of representation or self-representation, what one gets in terms of James and most of his discussion is he always pr promotes himself <laughs> as being individualistic. But James itself does not believe that. In fact, James, in his introduction to, and I, I read it, but I want to just go through it very, very briefly. In his preface, this is what James says. And I was interested about this because I think Hossburn has recent a book called History Makes the Same Point. Apart from James's preface to the, this book, apart from the, the and he, he made the point, he says, and I'm just going to read it very briefly because you all know it, 
But I think there's another thing you have to understand, I think. How does that formation influence the work that he does here? They're not separated. And I think James himself identifies this. And of course, I'll read a husband kind of code that says the same thing. But again, my friend Kajos says, if James says it's not usually recognized, if husband said it, it's usually uh, given much more pride of place. This is what James says. This book is neither cricket reminiscence nor autobiography. It poses the question, what do they know of cricket who only cricket know? The answer involves ideas as well as facts. And that's the fourth part that we talk a lot about, and of course, the question of Caesar. But then this is, I think, this important point that he makes in terms of the connectedness with that background and how that background influences what he does here. Keep in mind, I'm saying he got here at 32. At 32, you're a formed individual. You may go forward, but in terms of the basic structures, both geographical and others, they are formed. This is what James himself says. He says, the autobiographical framework shows the ideas more or less in the sequence that they developed in relation to the events, the facts and the personalities which prompted them. If the ideas, this is an important point, if the ideas originated in the West Indies, the ideas that, of course, go towards the making of Beyond Boundaries and who he was, he says, if the ideas originated in the West Indies, it was only in England and in English life and history that I was made to track them down and test them. To establish his own identity, Caliban, after three centuries, must himself pioneer into regions that, of course, Caesar himself never knew. Now, that's an important point, because it's one thing to make the case for that formation of which I speak. It's quite another thing, of course, to try to make the connections. How do they connect? James himself recognizes that he had those basic ideas which he saw and observed, but his experience of life both here and in France and the United States helps him to understand it. Now, Eric Hofsbund, in a book called History, says basically the same thing. I want to just read that quote very uh, briefly because I think it helps us to understand the connectedness of James's formation and uh, what he then did here when he comes over here. This is what Hofsbund says. He says, history consists of the interaction of variously and geographically distributed social entities, which mutually reshapes each other. Europe and non-Europe can no more be separated than Khaldun's Bedouin and sedentaries. Each is the other's history. In fact, Wolf argues, the geographical form of interaction is merely a special aspect of a more general pattern. The history of the working class in industrial society poses exactly the same problems as that of the impact of capitalism on nationally traditional societies supposedly arrested on some sphere of evolution. In fact, the two branches of history are but one. Or in even more generalized terms, whether society exports or imports capitalism belongs to the core of periphery, is developed and evolved out of the plurality of social orderings. In this sense, microcosm and macrocosm in history is one. My position, and I think James's position would be, that even though he was shaped by that, and he recognized, he talked about the fact that his father was a slave and so on, when he got here, having had that formation, he was then able to begin to utilize, and then, of course, all of the information you would gather here. But for me, the important point here is that the autobiographical framework shows that how ideas, more or less, in sequence, that they developed in, in relation to facts are very important. In a way, much of James's work after he left the West Indies involved pioneering into regions that Caesar himself did not know. But it was in England, to some degree, United States, that James had a chance to test and to flesh out ideas that had their germs in his homeland. James was, of course, 32 years old when he arrived in London, already a formed man and a formidable individual. How he interpreted social and political forces and social and political interactions in Trinidad the microcosm, the very much the same forces, the macrocosm, that you would, of course, encounter in London. Suffice it to say that the social and political experience in Trinidad prepared him for what had, he had to face in London and the United States of America. He was, alas, 
an important part of a formation that would do a lot to help us face and to understand. In other words, the James, we cannot cut James off and truncate him at 32 and says everything he knows or what is in London, is in Paris, is in the States. And I, I want to argue that D D James's background, the social, political, and intellectual history of Trent and Tobago in the 19th century, where there are a lot of forces coming together, a lot of languages group coming together, and of course a lot of evolution of forces in terms of class forces were very responsible for the making of James, which is then transmitted when he gets to this country. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, Sheldon. And we're going to move on now to our next speaker, Christian Hogsberg, who's actually instrumental in getting this conference to happen in the first place. And I think everybody will agree it's been a fantastic day, and starting with Selma's wonderful presentation this morning. And uh, it's also a book launch, because Christian has edited this book, which is called Toussaint Louverture, the story of the only successful slave revolt in history. And it's, it's got a great introduction by Christian. And it's also got one of my favorite photographs in it, which is this yeah. photograph, the Maverick Club in 1919, which uh, has got a picture of CLR age 70. It's got a picture of my father in it, is that right? <laughs> which is the, the year my father left the, having won the Ireland Scholarship and oh. came up to study Big thing, in yes. Britain. And he ended up in, he emigrated to Ghana in 1929. He too was a bright boy, right? <laughs> he was. So Christian, I think, is going to tell us something about, uh, well, I'll leave it to you, Christian. Thank you very much, Mark. We couldn't really be a more perfect place really to launch such a play such as Toussaint Louverture. And this Toussaint Louverture um, book is part, is, is part of a new series called the CLR James Archive series, um, which Robert Hill, who's a... Um, long-time um, support and friend, comrade of C.L.R. James is. Um, he's a um, historian um, of, of Marcus Garvey um, in his own right. And he, he would have liked to be here. And he did originally have pla had planned to be here, but he, um, he sends his greetings and, and, and apologies. When, when putting together this conference, what I suppose we were partly trying to do is, is try and show there is important new sort of scholarly work being done um, on C.L.R. James. And, and in a way, this scholarly work that's being done is building on the, the, the scholarship that went before. And I think that's why, you know, some, having someone like Selwyn here on the, on the panel is um, really important. That you, you know, you can't be a, uh, right on CLR James knowledge read without, without the fact that it's, an, it's a steady accumulation of work that's been done. But, but part of the point of this conference would be to try and bring together some of the sort of um, new work on James and new publications of, of, on, uh, by James that are coming out with... Uh, an audience in, in, in London for whom the legacy of C.L.R. James means, it means a great deal. To San Louverture really is the last major piece of C.L.R. James's work that's not been published to be published, <coughs> I, I, I think. It is really the literary companion volume to The Black Jacobins. Um, I just want to read something from the fore, foreword by um, Laurent Dubois, who's written an excellent history of the Haitian Revolution, mo modern history of the Haitian Revolution. He says, this literary work, he's talking about James' James's play to San Louverture, is, is a cru as crucial a contribution as the Black Jacobins has been. Written in a different register and to different ends, it nevertheless captures the density and drama of the Haitian Revolution. It bridges time and space, remarkably condensing an incredibly complex period in a series of memorable scenes and characters. It brings <coughs> together the sense of an epic event with the apt portrayal of historical characters. Both the play is called Toussaint Louverture, and many commentators focused in particular on the portrayal of that character by Paul Robeson, it is, in fact, much more than that. This is a drama that remarkably seeks to tell the whole history of the Haitian Revolution, of international imperial rivalry, of the emergence of a revolutionary consciousness, and of the creation of both a nation and a people. Someone spoke about the importance of C.L.R. James's intellectual formation in colonial Trinidad and the fact that he stands on the shoulders of a very rich sort of intellectual tradition in Trinidad and Tobago, itself shaped by sort of vibrant indigenous popular culture in Trinidad and, and, and shaped by South African heritage. But Toussaint Louverture was, was James wrote in 1932 to 34, so just when he's arriving in Britain. So in a way, it's, it's representative of James's voyage into Britain. So that's what I'm going to focus on, but it shouldn't be forgotten that while James was in Trinidad, he was researching and teaching West Indian history, writing his sort of implicitly anti-colonial short stories. Um, Minty Ali got written then, pioneering the West Indian novel in the process. I mean, Minty Ali was the first, I think, West Indian novel to be published in, in, in Britain. 
And he's also his political, he's developing political consciousness there in support for the Nationalist Trinidad Working Men's Association, which we mentioned Captain Cipriani. However, it's, it's really his experiences arriving in Britain that are, that are critical to understand why James, in some ways, writes the kind of play he, he writes. It's his political radicalisation, witnessing, we, we saw on the videos, a sort of poverty at the East End of London that J James witnessed. Selma James, in, in her contribution, talked about how the rise of fascism and, and racism on Europe, a continent sort of in the middle of the Great Depression, how James responded to that. And as he put it in 1933, he said, Hitler came to power, the world went political, I went with it. So, but particularly it was his, his experience of meeting the English working class in, in Nelson in Lancashire that was fundamental. Those 10 months were really 10 months that shook James's world in Nelson. And that led him on to reading Trotsky, talked about and his own independent study of Marx and his joining the, the Trotskyist movement. It's also, the, the, the video showed this very well, his um, in, def in defiant response to the rise of fascism, James made this um, defiant turn towards sort of more transnational identification with black people, a more radical trans uh, identification with black people and their heritage. And his turn, meeting people like um, Malcolm Nurse again, George Padmore, meeting um, his Haitian military historian in Paris, Augustine Moore. Um, he, he generally, he turns towards sort of militant pan-Africanism and breaks from any kind of, most of his residual identification with Imperial Britain that he'd grown up with, having grown up in a British colony. And I think if James hadn't politically radicalised, I'd suggest that 1934 was really, perhaps, this has come out of the controversial Mike Quaid debate, was, I think, the most single important year in CLR James's life for his intellectual and political evolution. Um, his visits to France, his, his witnessing of uh, a general strike in France against the danger of, of France, a, a fascist coup in France, his witnessing and his sense that really work, working class people have the same interest, whether they're in the West Indies, whether they're in uh, Lancashire, whether they're in Western Europe, or, whether they're in, on the continent. So, and I think if James hadn't had this transformation towards, intellectual transformation towards Marxism, he'd have written a, still a very, very interesting play about Toussaint. He, we, you know, he, he, he wanted, he was fascinated by Toussaint. Toussaint captured, captivated his imagination <laughs> growing up in Trinidad just because of what, what Toussaint and the Haitian Revolution represented. Uh, the sort of vindication of black achievements, black accomplishments in the face of racism, but also more profoundly, the, you know, the first post-colonial revolution, if you like, a revolution that led to the first independent black republic outside of Africa, and what and what that what that meant in the context of a struggle against colonialism, a struggle for West Indian self-government. But I think his play would have been different. I think I think his play would have still had the rich humour. It would still have been beautifully written. You know, it would have been a classic play alongside the other classic plays of the Haitian Revolution by people like M. A. Césaire, Langston Hughes. Edward Gleeson, Derek Walcott. But I think without his James's Marxist and, and, and militant Pan-African politics, it wouldn't have the stridently anti-imperialist uh, dimension uh, that it did have as, as a thing. It wouldn't have the same theoretical clarity about the dynamics of race and class and the balance of forces within the Haitian Revolution. As, as I think James said on one of the videos, it was about a method, wasn't it? It was about... Um, he, he had an angle when he came to writing the Haitian Revolution. He was using similar sources which other historians had used, but he had an angle, the sense that it was actually the ordinary enslaved people who were actually uh, central to, to liberating themselves. But liberation came from below, um, but emancipation from slavery was the act of the enslaved themselves. That, that comes through very clearly in Toussaint Louverture, and obviously in the Black Jacobins it's, it's um, writ large as well. I think what James did really as well, and he does this in the Black Jacobins and he does this in his, is really for the first time he puts Toussaint Louverture on the historical stage as a world historical figure, I think, in, in many ways. Uh, you know, he's a, you have a, it's an age of Napoleon, Wellington, Nelson. James says Toussaint is as important a figure as those, in fact, second only to Bonaparte, I think he argues, in, in historical significance, which is quite a claim, but it's backed up in the, in the Black Jacobins. He shows the Haitian Revolution is not just a revolution, but he's actually one of the great world historical revolutions, like the English Civil War, like the American War of Independence, like the French Revolution, and like the American Civil War, but you know, forever transformed the world and laid the foundation for sort of continuing struggles um, ever since. It's sort of a, you know an inspiration in many ways. James argues actually the Haitian Revolution is even more radical than those great revolutions um, in the age of sort of bourgeois revolution that took place because it's it went further in its commitment to the ideals of liberty, equality, fraternity, the great Enlightenment ideals. It actually went further in its commitment to use universal emancipation um, than, than, than those others. Um, and really, um, as Laurent du Dubois again points out, you know, if the slaves hadn't risen up, risen up in 1791, then really, you know, the French Revolution would have gone its way without having repercussions in the colonial world. Three years after the Haitian Revolution erupted, 
1791, the French are forced to abolish slavery across the French Empire. It's the first great, you know, first, so it's a, you know, it's a historic moment in terms of parliaments. Only three years after the Haitian Revolution victorious end in 1804, the British are forced to end their participation in the slave trade. I'll say, I'll say a few more things that just, just are quite remarkable. The play gets written in 1934. What's, re, what's quite remarkable is how such a, a play about um, a revolutionary struggle for black liberation, how such a play can get to be performed in Britain is itself quite, really quite remarkable. There was huge censorship of, of the theatre. Britain was, you know, the great imperial metropolis. It was a dark heart of the British Empire. And yet, you know, this play gets performed in 1936, and that's, that's, that's owed in, in part to, the, to a tradition in, in Britain, a progressive tradition of, of left-wing left wing, um, drama. The stage society um, exists, and they, they get round the censorship by putting on private performances. And, and so they're able to uh, uh, yes, circumvent the censorship. The other thing that's critical is the, is the decision which, which, um, which James mentioned in, in, the, in the film of Paul Robeson agreeing to take on the starring role. Robeson himself um, was himself politically radicalising, as, as James points, in, this, in the context of the Depression, in the context of the rise of fascism, and so on. Um, but to, Robeson had always dreamed of starring in a play written by a black playwright about the Haitian Revolution. It actually did, did the thing justice. And when James's script was given to him, he agreed to, to play it. It was the only time Robeson ever starred in a play written by a playwright of African heritage. It was... Its production in, in the Westminster Theatre by the Stage Society in 1936 was the, um, was the first time black professional actors had starred um, in a play written by a black playwright on, on the British stage. So it's an enormously important production play, um, not only in its own right as a play, but it's for its production as well, um, in terms of black British theatre, um, African Caribbean theatre, and Yvonne Brewster, who's also on the panel, is going to... Um, she stands in, 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 that, in that tradition, and, and, and she'll obviously talk more a little bit about that. One final thing. I've, I've got some other points I was going to make about, about the importance of the play and its, its relevance today and the struggles we see today. But the Tories, I don't, and I'll just say this briefly, the Tories at the moment are not only um, waging a vicious and nasty war on working-class people in general, they're also trying to rewrite British history. They, yeah. Michael Gove... Yeah. Michael Gove is re taking it on himself to rewrite the national curriculum for himself. It's, it's taking back British history to the 1930s, actually the time James is writing this play. It's a celebration of the British Empire that, that Gove wants to perpetuate, the rise of Britain and an island story and then the rise of Britain, how it, how it went around um, the world. Um, the, the ruling class are very, very good at celebrating their heroes and their vision of heroes. So, for example, we're seeing a new biography of Margaret Thatcher appearing on the uh, but out very, very soon, £30 pound hardback, uh, 894 pages on the first years of Margaret Thatcher's rise to power coming out. They're very, very good at doing, at, 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 at putting their view of history across for their, for their, for their great uh, fighters for, their, for the ruling class. William Hague, who's the current Tory Foreign Secretary, in 2007 wrote a book, <laughs> William Wilberforce, which people at key stage one, five to seven year olds in Britain, are now going to have to learn about William Wilberforce. I suggest they're going to learn about William Wilberforce, not from the black Jacobins and what James says, actually a very careful analysis of exactly what, what role Wilberforce played. They're not going to learn about it from C.L.R. James. They're going to learn about Wilberforce from William Hague's biography. William Hague's biography, a biography of, of, it, has, it has one paragraph on the Haitian Revolution. He doesn't even call it the Haitian Revolution. Um, you get, you know, it's a bloody slave rebellion. It's... Um, he doesn't call it the Haitian Revolution. He has no mention of Toussaint Louverture in his book at all. And he actually, this, this, this edition actually carries the speech that Haig gave in Parliament in 2007 for the bicentenary of the um, abolition of the British participation in the slave trade. And Haig, I'll just read a little bit just because it's quite humorous. Haig, here's this bit of speech. Haig goes, in 1807, the act was passed and the then Prime Minister, William Grenville, was very keen to railroad it through both Houses of Parliament and described it as the most glorious measure but had ever been adopted by any legislative body in the world. This country, Britain, was the first in Europe, other than Denmark, to outlaw the slave trade, and the Act was the catalyst for the adoption of similar legislation around the world. It became a moral benchmark, which other civilised societies rightly took note. This is, it's, it's historically problematic for some reasons I've mentioned. But, but Diane Abbott then just comes up and, and, and she says, the first, she reminds Haiti, the first country in the world to abolish slavery was Haiti, which fought a revolution to do so under the leadership of Toussaint Louverture. And William Hague goes, yes, 
Uh, full stop. Um, he says, um, being only partway through my historical analysis, I, I wanted to come to Haiti, in a moment, in fact. And then he goes off a point, and then he finally, you know, comes back to, bounds back to Haiti, um, pages later, where he mentions that William Wilberforce had some correspondence with Henry Christoph, one of the later leaders of the Haitian Revolution. But the point is, what he doesn't tell about is the fact that some facts, just two facts about British history, but Haig just misses out in his whole speech and, and misses out. From 1657 to 1807, Britain transported, British ships transferred more slaves across the Atlantic than all the other European nations put together. That's one fact I don't think is going to make it into <laughs> the new national curriculum. Another fact is that he talks, very t later Haig talks about, um, he talks about how the, the Haitian Revolution, the Haitians had to overthrow their colonial masters, i.e. the French. He ignores the fact that the British army from 1794 to 1798 waged a brutal war to try and recolonize Haiti and reimpose slavery on the people there. That's, you know, that, that, this is the kind of history we're not going to get. I'll just send one more. Do people know, when we look, this, Hague's, Hague's um, goes for Tory's curriculum, national curriculum. It's going to be full of great white men and, and their achievements and how marvelous they are. One, they're not going to mention, they're obviously not going to mention people like Toussaint Louverture, they're not going to mention the, the people like C.L.R. James who fought against racism and for civil, for the civil rights and uh, social justice in Britain. They, they figures black and, participation of black and Asian people in Britain is, is out, sidelined, just as women are sidelined from the new, collision, new curriculum, just as working class history is <coughs> sidelined new curriculum. One final thing, one great, <laughs> one great white man who's not going to make it into the national curriculum is, is General Sir James Duff. Has anyone heard of General Sir James Duff? Final points. General Sir James Duff, <laughs> which people should have done, he hit the news recently. He was, um, he was an army officer and a one-time MP for Banffshire in Scotland. He hit the news recently because not only was he the son of one of David Cameron's great-grand-uncles, the second Earl of Fife, he was, he was David Cameron's sixth cousin, first cousin six times removed, I'll get this right. But one of, among other his glorious achievements of General Sir James Duff, MP, Thanks to the work of the, uh, the legacy of a British slave ownership project at UCL, team around Catherine Hall, Stuart Hall's um, partner, reveals that Sir James owned 200 slaves on the grain sugar estate in Jamaica. Um, in 1833, with official abolition, um, ab official abolition of slavery, thanks to the Jamaican slave revolt of 1831 to 32, in no small part, another event that's not going to make it onto the national curriculum. Sir James was awarded 4,101 pounds equal to more than three million pounds today to compensate him for the loss of his property, the, the slave, the, the, the fact he's going to no longer be a brutal, tyrannical slave, slave owner. Um, and really, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, <laughs> I'll, I think I'll end, I'll end there, but to be honest, mm. there's a battle on for history, there's a battle yeah. on for history, and um, at the moment, so works like C.L.R. James' Two Sunday Literature, works like C.L.R. James' Black Jackman's whole work, could not be more relevant and timely mm. in our time of economic crisis today, our time when there's rising racism and fascism movements, we need our history, we need to celebrate our great, much more heroic history, the history of the oppressed and the exploited and their struggles, um, rather than these, rather than the likes of Sir Charles Moore, editor of the Daily Telegraph's hag hagiography or hagiography, hagiography of, of William Hague, um, celebrating the likes of William Wilberforce. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christian. Well, on the subject of Wilberforce, I should say that um, Moira Stewart, who happens to be my cousin, yeah. made a film in 2007 called In Search of William Wilberforce, trying to put another point of view, which you probably never saw because they buried it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're now going to hear from Yvonne Brewster, who was the a founder of Tarawa Theatre Company, who in, I think your first production in 1986 was The Black Jacobins by C.L.R. James. So perhaps you'd like to say a few words about that, Yvonne? Thank you very much, Margaret. Do you know, one nice thing about today has been the enthusiasm, because uh, everybody that has spoken, uh, everything that we've seen, has such an incredible enthusiasm about Nello. Now, I call C.L.R. James, Mr. James, Nello, because that's what I yeah, learned to, to do. And um, I am not an intellectual, nor am I an academic, and nor do I have any papers from which to read. And I have been asked just quickly to just give a bit of um, interesting background, perhaps, to how the Black Jacobins came 
to be on the English stage in 1986. And I will do, so I said I needed five minutes, and one thing about me is that um, I'm gonna just take probably 4.59, okay? <laughs> Um, and this is how <laughs> you tell me that you're a BBC man, right? <laughs> no, no, I am not. No, I am not. Well, that was a nice cheap trick, wasn't it? <laughs> okay. Um, the year is 1985, and there is at somewhere in Camden the. I can't remember the exact title of this book fair, but I think it's Radical Black. International <laughs> Black Book Fair, Radical which Black. used to happen, something like that. <laughs> so it used to happen every year in London. It was fabulous. Now, this was also the year when a person called Margaret, <coughs> as in Thatcher, had decided that she was going to decapitate the GLC. I had never got any money as a sort of producer of plays in this country from anybody really. But then I got this mysterious phone call saying, you're the only person that hasn't put in for a subsidy to produce a play. Yvonne, what is wrong with you? <laughs> And I said, oh, well, I can't bother because I know about the Arts Council and every time I put in a thing, it's always meant to go back and it's not quite political enough and the rest of it. I can't be bothered. Don't be ridiculous. I need something in here in six days uh -oh. and I want it to be something, a big thing like what you like to do. Now, I like mega things, you know? Okay. So I said, okay. I took it as a bit of a challenge. <laughs> so I wrote up this application to the GLC in the waning years of Mr. Ken Livingston's rule, and I sent it off thinking nothing more about it. I did do one thing deliberately, which wasn't to put an income stream in. <laughs> I just said I really needed 23 actors, and I needed to go to the Riverside, and it was a big theater, and I needed to bring choreographers, African-American, Jamaican choreographers from someplace. And I needed this, and I needed that, and I, and I just wrote it down and multiplied everything sort of <laughs> roughly by about 50% and sent it in and thought no more. Well, in two days, the phone went and said, you got the money. Uh -oh. <laughs> That's well, the, the money was 85, <laughs> the money was 85,000 pounds. My husband, who is a very respectable sort of person, unlike myself, says to me, how did you sign that application? I said, just with my name. What address do you use, my darling? I said, well, our home address. He said, uh-uh, stop right now. Because when your airy-fairy ideas come to grief and not selling the house. <laughs> Went, oh my God, he said, you have to form a company now. So I phoned up some friends of mine, Mona Hammond, who you may or may not know, yes. Carmen Monroe, who you may or may not know, all these are lovely ladies, and a lodger that I had in my house at the <coughs> time, who was a brilliant stage manager called Inigo Espahel. And I said to them, listen to me, you have to be my board. I need to form a theater company like tonight. <laughs> Carmen says, what are we going to call it? I said, I don't know. She said, oh, something round. Mona says, what are you going to call it? Yes, we'll come. Oh, I don't know. Now, Yvonne, you're good at those things. Choose a name. And so it went on. Well, I went at the back of Cassidy, which is a Jamaican dictionary, and I found, I found Zuzu Wap first, that is a Z. <laughs> I thought that sounded too African. So I went a little bit further and I saw Talawa, spelled T-A-L-L-A-W-A-H. And I thought the double L and the H might so make it sound, look too African. So I took a, and re-spelled the thing, T-A-L-A-W-A, -A, formed the company, although it was really just in my brain, sent off the application, and then the check was written 
to Talawa. Oh. Okay. The play that I thought that we would do would be the Black Jacobins. Yvonne had never asked for permission. Now, Mr. Darkus Howe, I thought was supposed to be here today. He is not, unfortunately, but anyway, he, he was helpful in his way. And, <laughs> and he said, um, well, I don't know. I was at the, the, the book fair, and I said to him, I mean, I need permission to do the Black Jacobins. The what? I said, the Black Jacobins, you know, the play? No, nobody does that. I said, I need to see Nello, but you have to have permission, you know, to pass through, because that time he was, he was protected a bit, quite rightly. Anyway, I finally got there one day, on a Wednesday afternoon, and it was half term, and my 10-year-old son had to come with me, and I said, in the journey, look, this is C.L.R. James, he's a very important man, learn it after me, C.L.R. James. Yes, mommy, what did he do? I said, this, read, this, right. And when you go, shut up, don't say anything. We walked up the stairs, and he was sitting there with a picture of Renoir on an easel, studying it. And he said, mm. you know, who are you to Julian? Oh, I know who you are. I have read The Silver Sword. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what you did. He said, um, thank you. And for the, for the honor of calling me C.S. Lewis, but at least your mother is making, <laughs> <laughs> making you read books. <laughs> now, you can do cricket, come. And he taught him how to spin. Look, look. And there am I sitting down, nervous. Can I do your play? He paid me no attention at all. And, and he showed Julian, and Julian is there, and they're in this small room, and he can't move too much, you know, and, and there they were practicing bowling, Spin. you know. It was so marvelous. And then he said, all right, okay, I need to ask you two questions about this play. I like your son, so that might work, <laughs> okay. Why do you want to do it? So I went into this prepared spiel about it was f exactly 50 years since Paul Robeson had done this play, and then I really need to come to see that we could field black actors who worked in England. We didn't have to go to the United States of America for African Americans. We could field 23 people on the stage coming out of the English situation. Oh yeah, that sounds good, right, right. You have the money. Well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> yes, <laughs> which is a very unusual answer to be able to give at that stage. And then he said, okay, one more question. And he said, um, tell me, who is your favorite character in the play? This is, this is, it has been published, The Black Jacobins. It was published in 1967 for Carifesta. And this is the only copy in this country. And it mash up. And I think, but anyway, it's my, and he said, who is your favorite character? I kind of knew it off by, by heart by that time. And you know, I made one of the biggest mistakes of my life. And, <laughs> and you can, I'll share this with you because I wanted to impress Nello. And I told a lie. I said, I misread him as such an idiot. And I should have known. I said, oh, Dessaline. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He said to me, I don't see how Not you sure. are going to produce Not this play <laughs> since Edie Amin is your favorite character. <laughs> Good bad. And he said, you didn't really mean that, did you? And I said, no, I, I didn't. He said, you're more intelligent than that, aren't you? <laughs> yes. You can do the play. <laughs> but you know, that testing thing, just like he did with Stuart in the film, mm -hmm. 
You read it. You read it. You read all of it. You understand this book. You know he was. He's very. That was addressed a, to me. Was it addressed to you? <laughs> and oh, I, I thought floundered. It was, I, I thought floundered it was, in the wings. Oh, I think I thought it was Stuart. No, you know, no, it was me. because he's just. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. would ask you immediately. You know, and I thought it was so wonderful, <coughs> and really, that's how it came to be. And I must say that it was the first production of Tallowa Theatre Company, which was formed in 1985 and is 27 years old now. And it's the Black Theatre Company in England that's had the longest life. We've had our ups, we've had our downs. I have nothing to do with it anymore because I'm a true believer in handing over handing over so that the next person can take it. Because if, if, you, if you wait, you have to go when they're still wanting you to stay. <laughs> Don't no, wait until they wish you had gone. <laughs> and so it's still there. <laughs> and one of my <coughs> students is now running Tarawa, which is even better. And so I think that CLR James, with his political nouns, his wonderful humanity, and his exceptional achievement has helped this tiny example of how if you can get it if you really want thank you thank you um, thank you very much um, we're going to have a, a few questions maybe three or four questions brief questions um, Mike has joined us so there may be questions on his films or on any of the presentations today one at the back. Okay, someone mentioned how CLR James did not come out of a vacuum. And I just wanted to state, for example, if you look at the Black Jacobins, where he begins to talk about slavery, he talks about how the argument, part of the argument of slavery was that however difficult it was for the slaves in the West, you know, um, it was much better than to live in a kind of primitive, savage Africa. So he already begins to talk about that. But then also when you look at the association with people like Paul Robeson, you look at the fact that he lived in Ghana, James lived in Ghana at the time and wrote the Nkrumah Revolution. You look at the connection with Paul Robeson. You look at um, the fact that Claudia Jones, um, who has had a book written on her recently called Beyond Containment by Carl Boyce Jervis, who was also, like James, expelled from the U.S. for so-called communist activity. There's a whole also diaspora and intellectual tradition that James belongs to, you know, aside, aside the Trotsky, the Marx, etc., which is actu actually not often talk, talked about, and even Franz Fanon, who's in Ghana around about the same time in terms of the African Revolution, at, at the same time as James is, as Padmore is. So all those figures, James, Padmore, Fanon, uh, Robeson, etc. And even when James talks in, um, in The Black Jacobins about how Bonaparte, to say Louverture Lover, is a greater um, revolutionary than Bonaparte, that's actually taken from Gavi, who stated much earlier that Sajana Truth and others deserve to be saints in much the same breath as Joan of Arc or Toussaint Louverture is a greater general than Napoleon. So what I'm saying simply, simply is that th we need to begin to look at James also within a broader context where it's connected to his African heritage. I have two questions. One is for Kojo. I, I see the beyond the boundary, the, using the term of cricket as a metaphor. And if you were asked to write the foreword on that, how would you define it? What do you think that there is a real message in that metaphor? The other one is for Sam, who has made the film. I would like to ask Sam how he has addressed the impact of, of America on, on, on the socioeconomic nuances of, of Haiti, right? Um, how he has addressed that, and also has he addressed the question of Haiti paying reparation to France? James was very important. He makes the same comments. It's really James is more concerned about the, the, the sort of the ideology of cricket, the ideas, what it does. James makes the point that QRC was like another Eton. And he was, in, I mean, the fellow Tom Hughes, uh, whatever that book was, he talks Tom about. Bronx school Tom Brown's school days. But James is more concerned about how, in fact, imperialism imposes an idea of life through a game which is much more important at the everyday level. In point of fact, cricket was being played in Trinidad, I think, as early as the 1840s, the 1830s. I could give you examples of that. So that, that's what I would talk about. But James is also concerned about another thing, which I want to ask Chris one question as I go along, is that James was more con uh, very concerned about the fact it's inundated the first chapter with his background, his African background, his mother, his father's Africanism. And just to tie up with Kajo's last point, is that Christina made the point, just another way of reading, that 1834 would have been the most seminal and important year for James. 
1934. Yeah. 1934, yes. And I was wondering, and of course, he talked about how he, how he situates and locates Toussaint. Mm -hmm. But remember, James came here as a novelist. He said 1928 yeah. is his very first yeah. short stories. He walks here with Minty Alley. He does the play, etc. So it seems to me that James is a writer, a novelist in that sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that what he does with mm. Toussaint is to make Toussaint the central epic figure. He was all mm. concerned about the Greeks and so on. Mm. So it is quite true that Marxism, as a mode of inquiry and practice, mm. informs his methodology, particularly the materialist formation of how one thinks. But I'd be a little careful because I think it goes back to that point. If we put too much of emphasis on what happens after he lands here, we forget the fact he brought something with him. And I think the notion of his portraying Toussaint as that magnificent epic figure yeah. has to do with reading of history yeah. and the centrality of liter literary theory yeah. and literary ideas yeah. in his yeah. work. So I would be a little yeah. careful about situating yeah. that 34 has been so very uh, privileged yeah. in terms of his own formation. Yeah. You're right. James, James was, it's worth remembering his first book was The Life of Captain Cipriani, 1932. The very title of that book shows his, how he recognized the importance of person, you know, personalities and, you know, key individuals and mm -hmm. leaders and so on in, in, in Caribbean liberation struggles. So I accept that point. Just on U.S. occupation of Haiti was going on, and this is, you know, sort of continuing now, it was but it, from 1915 to 1934, while James was writing Toussaint, Louverture, Haiti's o o occupied, so I should, have, I should have mentioned that by the U.S. Your more important point which you make in your thesis is the whole role of the Spanish Civil War, which is really shaping... For the, for, the, for the Black Jacobins. Yes, for the Black Jacobins, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, the other final point, just... So this U.S. occupation of Haiti is very important. Um, by, the time the, by the time the play gets, the, gets performed in uh, 1936, Mussolini's war on... barbaric war on the people of Ethiopia is going on, so the, the production takes on huge resonance mm -hmm. and symbolic resonance there. That's just, what's interesting is that the 1930s is a really interesting time in terms of Haiti. It, there's a huge number of plays, productions of Haiti, most of them in America. Um, so Orson Welles, for example, does his sort of voodoo Macbeth mm. uh, in 1936. Langston Hughes um, does, a, does a play that gets produced um, in America. What's interesting is that Robeson, you know, is American. He actually stars in his only real play about the Haitian Revolution on the, on the British stage, you know, uh, given, given the huge cultural ferment and, and the Harlem Renaissance and everything that's in America. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. My name is John Page. I'm part of the Hackney Unites organisation. And as uh, Ngoma outlined earlier this morning, in, in effect, the reason we're here is because Hackney Council wanted to take the name CLR James off the library. And there was a reaction to that, which said we're, we're not having that history buried. Um, as we're coming to the close, I have a question for the panel, because today appears at the moment to be an event in isolation. And one of the things CLR James would always say is you need to know where you're going. Where do you think a CLR James legacy project should be going after today? Very quick question. I know, I know what you think of Gove, so please don't misconstrue this as a Govite I, thing. But CLR wrote lots of lists of books himself and recommendations for people in terms of what they should read. You know, all sorts of from the Enlightenment, Greeks, and so on and so forth. Would you, what do you think about the idea of a new canon? Is there a problem with the idea of a canon per se? Or can we have a canon that would include CLR <coughs> and other great writers? Because the canon is back in being debated along with this idea of history. Kristen made a point about black Japanese and the Haitian Revolution as being part of the ocean of modernity. Certainly with the, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, mm -hmm. the Haitian Revolution in terms of the usher of the bringing to into being the rights and rule of the common man and person has to be central to that. So any new canon, I think, must include that. And I see you've included Mary Seacole. I want to put in, instead of Miss Florence Nightingale, put on her, the wonderful, the wonderful. So I think in, those, in that canon, it would have to include at least those two books. Mike. Mary Seacole is back in because we did a petition. <laughs> <laughs> Action. If I had to think of one book that would be the most unlikely book for me to have read three times before the age of ten, it would be Vanity Fair. Oh, and the yeah. astonishing thing for me when I first was the actually astonishing surprises of the books that meant so much to C.L.R. James. And actually, Vanity Fair. And so it suggests to me that really you don't really know where the beginning of your consciousness happens.
And for CLR James, it happened in the most surprising space. And who would have predicted out of that the trajectory of his own intellectual and political life? So I'm rather wary of canons. Okay. Because they always, whatever they include, they exclude. Well, by and I'm rather suspicious of it. The only person I wouldn't want to make it is Mr. Gove. <laughs> <laughs> I would suggest Sex, Race and Class by Selma James. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> As far as C.L.R. James was concerned, there were four novelists in the world. Naipaul, Laming, who were there? Selwyn. Selwyn. Selva. But he counted about four persons. They were his canon. So that Wilson Harris, yeah, Wilson Harris, Naipaul, four, I can't remember exactly. So they were his, as far as he was concerned, there were only four writers in the world in the, from the Caribbean. So we have to be very careful about canons. Uh, but I, I, have a, I have a very quick, a quick question for Selma, if I may. Uh, Kajo, thank you very much for that contribution. But Selma, did, did Nello, um, when he was writing, did he write a draft which had to be corrected? He wrote, and then he corrected that by hand. Then it was typed, and then he put some corrections on the script, on the typescript. But he didn't really write drafts. I mean, in the sense of you write a draft and then that's no use and you'd write something else. The only draft I know about was the one of the book that I spoke about earlier because he wrote a draft which then was not satisfactory in its trajectory and he had to start again. But other than that, there were no drafts no, that I saw. Well, I would really like to know. <laughs> <laughs> because I read the book, <laughs> and I didn't think a lot about it. <laughs> but uh, you have to understand how Nello read books. The first thing is he read the same book over and over again, sometimes for months and sometimes for years. And he read everything that... You know, I was clearing up one day and found a copy of Beeching with the railway plan marked. <laughs> so he had clearly read it. But he read books that he didn't agree with because there was something in it that he needed. He didn't read books because they were valuable in themselves. Books were tools. He read them because there were things in them that he needed, and he, he always worked. That's the other thing. He always worked. I mean, there, he was not a professional. He was a worker. You know, he worked all the time, and he was either always reading or always talking to himself, walking down the street, hmm. where people, they, before there were telephones, you know, people didn't know whether he was <laughs> with us or not. Uh, but he was a worker, a constant worker, and a constant <laughs> reader, and his reading was particular. The other thing, I've, ne I've never seen annotations like the books. I mean, I went through his shelves, and mm -hmm. they're the most annotated books I've ever looked at. I mean, I, I find it's almost sacrilegious to write all over books. <laughs> he did the exact opposite. They're there the were two. Required, yeah. They're sort of scribed and inscribed and yeah. right on the mm. See page 18, yeah. Dobbin exclamation mark, you know, all sorts of yeah. things. I mean, mm. it was you read the books. Mm. You read, read in a way which you is read absolutely <laughs> distinctive. Yeah. Yeah. And there is quite a lot about class and racism in yeah. Of course. And, yes. and to some extent, enough. class trumps racism, which is a good description of mm. great British society. Yeah, I, I just, just a couple of things, and I say it with some... There's no question that what you said about CLR coming as a fully formed man at 32, we are. There's no question about that. 31, 32. And not only that, he had already done something which was quite extraordinary in that having um, written Minty Alley, he had written it in the way that ordinary people talk in the West Indies, and that was, to my knowledge, the first time that that was ever done. In the most direct sense, Naipaul and the rest of them built on him. All of them. 
right? Because he was the first one, I think, to, to, uh, to have done that. And you can look at 1934 as well, and, and, and that whole period in Britain, which, which you have done an extraordinary job of, of pulling together and just blew my mind when, when, I, when I read what you had done, done on it. But I think it is critical, and I, I didn't want it to go unsaid, you cannot, as I saw recently in one piece, make a critique of CLR, and I knew him as Jimmy. Selma called him Nello in the house, and I called him Jimmy, because that's what the American comrades called him, without looking at what happened in the United States and the 15 years that he spent there and the changes in his political thinking which went on and which then changed many of the things which he looked, he didn't go back and change the Black Jacobins. He never went back, he, fi he figured those, those, those books always stood for themselves. Um, and, and you had to look at how they were written. But he would write afterwards in various things. And one of the things he said about the Black Jacobins um, was that when you look at who the slaves were, they were the nearest thing to a, a modern proletariat that anybody had ever seen, right? That the, the plantation was really a factory. And that's a tremendous thing to have, have said about something that was happening at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. And I say this, um, that I really do think you have to look at the totality of the man to get any, any idea of, of, of what he was really about. Um, and one great thing is in, as Margaret said, in Sex, Race, and Class by Selma James, um, the last piece... Um, on, on CLR's political legacy, and I would recommend it to people. I want to be careful, and I want to insist upon it in all due respect. If you look at Jane's career by Delissa in Jamaica, it's talking about Jane, who is an ordinary worker in 1917. If you go back to 1907, you have Rupert Gray, who's talking about ordinary people. In fact, the scenes begin on a railway. Let us be very careful, as much as we idolize James, Remember, there's a history prior to James. And even as he talks about the, 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 the workers in the Caribbean as being the first modern poetry, he says. Again, it supports the point that there's notions of social organization. And the working class, we didn't call them the working class, we call them probably working people, as Walter does in, our, in the history of the Ghana's working people, that there are formations that are taking place there. J Let's be careful. I love James as much as you guys do. But let us be very careful when we begin to idolize and privilege people in an absence of the history. There are works that talks about those folks prior to Minty Alley. Thank you, Sylvia. I, I think what we've proved is there's enough again, material and discussion for another conference at least. So perhaps we should just try and sum it up now. And thank you. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.